1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, reading verses 1 and 2. Peter writes, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his life in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So, in the previous chapter, in chapter 3, Peter had been giving counsel to the readers of this particular letter because they're suffering. We're going to see that as we go through and continue through First Peter. But this is a church, this is a group of people, these are people who are suffering. And so what he was sharing with them, as we saw in chapter 3, is that he was sharing with them that Jesus had died for them, and he had said in chapter 3, verse 18, that, that they ought to live for him. And so Jesus has ransomed them, and in doing so, he suffered. And the scripture makes it very clear that our Messiah, that our Jesus suffered as no man ever suffered. Now, the suffering of Messiah, the suffering of Jesus, uh, fulfilled Old Testament prophecy. And, and that's something you see throughout the, uh, the, uh, the New Testament. I want to remind you of something that occurred in the book of Acts in chapter 3 where there was a man who had laid, been laid at the gate that is called Beautiful there in the city of Jerusalem, and daily he had been there, and daily he had been asking alms of people who had entered in, who were entering in. And so on one occasion at the hour of prayer, we're told that Peter and John had made their way through that, and they were going to this gate that was called Beautiful. And as they did so, they encountered this man who had been crippled from, from his mother's womb. And uh, as they were walking in, remember the story with me for just a moment. Remember how that the Apostle Peter, looking down at the man as he's there laid at the gate, said to him, look upon us, or look at us. And, and Luke tells us that the man looked up expecting to receive something from them, meaning he was expecting to receive uh, an alms because they would be there asking for alms or a charitable gift and it would be supplied by the pilgrims who were entering into the uh, temple area to worship the Lord, and very often that's the best place to ask for help. It's at the gate of a place where people go to worship God. And so he's expecting to receive something, but the Scripture tells us that instead of handing him silver or gold, Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, he said to him, rise to your feet and walk. And reaching down, he took him by the hand, and the scripture says that the man received strength from his ankles all the way through his body. He stood up, he began to walk, he began to leap, he began to praise God, and he was holding fast to them when the people began to gather around, knowing that this was the one who had been in that condition for so long. And as this crippled man is now healed, he's, he's excited and all, the people are gathering, Peter took the opportunity to preach, and as he preached... Peter made it clear concerning Messiah, that Messiah was to suffer. In Acts 3, verse 18, he said, Those things which God foretold by the mouth of all of his prophets, that Christ, that the Christ would suffer, he has fulfilled. And so when Peter is speaking concerning the fact that Jesus suffered, he's pointing to the fact that the Old Testament prophesied that Messiah would do so. And that theme of suffering Messiah is found throughout the Old Testament. I'll give you a couple of examples as I lay the foundation here. In the Psalms, in Psalm 22, verses 14 through 17, the psalmist said, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are, are out of joint. My heart is like wax that has melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue clings to my jaws. You have brought me to the dust of death. Dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones, and they look and stare at me, which is a prophecy a thousand years before Christ of crucifixion. Isaiah 53, 3 and 4, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We esteemed him not. Surely he, has, he, he took up our infirmities, carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. 
So Jesus suffered as no man suffered. And the believers are undergoing affliction and suffering. And Peter is encouraging them. And he's telling them that they're to have a particular attitude as they're undergoing these difficult times. He'll say it in chapter 4, verse 7, when he says, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, he says, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now, why would they be serious and watchful? Well, the time is short, so people should live righteously. One of the things that you see throughout the New Testament as it predicts the return of Christ and the way we should live is, uh, it, it, well, it's found in so many very so many places, various places, it's that, uh, that people should live in a righteous way in anticipation of being with him. The, the book of James, chapter 5, 8 and 9, you too be patient, stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, you'll be judged. The judge, he says, is standing at the door. The Lord's coming is near. Philippians 4, verse 5, let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. This upcoming uh, Sunday, I'll be teaching on the rapture. I'll be giving you a lot more scriptures related to this, but there's a, a preparation for this. We should be anticipating the return of the Lord, and we shouldn't be surprised at the things that we go through prior to his taking us to be with him. So they're to be preparing themselves. They have what would be called personal responsibility to be prepared for warfare as well as for their suffering. So, when he's speaking to them, and he says again in verse 1, since Christ suffered up for us in the flesh, he says, arm yourselves also with the same mind. What is he speaking about? Arm yourself with the same mind? Well, he's speaking of the attitude, the attitude Christ had. Jesus' attitude included a willingness to suffer while doing the will of God. And so our attitude is to be as his in, in Philippians 2, 5 through 8, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient to death, even death on a cross. So your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Be prepared. Why? Well, he says, because Christ suffered for us. It says, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves with that same mind. Now, to suffer speaks of enduring bad treatment. And so we should be prepared for that. Again, he's speaking to persecuted believers. Jesus suffered and he died. We should be willing to suffer along with him. So he's saying, believers are to arm ourselves with that mentality. Now, it's interesting how he says in verse 1, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. I'll take a few moments to deal with that. He who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Does that mean that if we have suffered in that way that we no longer are sinners? Is this speaking about sinless perfection? I've had guys say that they are sinlessly perfect. And then you talk to the wife. It's over. <laughs> Is that what he's saying? That, that, that if you've gone through suffering and all, that you become sinless, you become perfect? Because that's how people would uh, sometimes interpret that. Notice again, he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. What does that mean? Well, one, there is no such thing as sinless perfection. To say that you are without the ability to sin is error. Ecclesiastes 7.20 Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. 1 John chapter 1, verse 10. If we say that we have not sinned, and this would be even after being saved, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. His word is not in us. So this is not speaking of sinless perfection. So what do you mean when you say have ceased from sin? When you're loving... When you're in love with the Lord, when you're so grateful that Christ has saved you, and I believe that most if everyone, almost everyone, if not every one of us in this room, would be very grateful for what the Lord has done. When it speaks concerning us ceasing from sin, that means that we have ceased wanting to and knowingly continue in sin. 
I got saved. That, that means I don't want to be in the old world that I used to live in. That means that I don't want to go back to the drinking. That means I don't want to go back to the, that means I don't want to go back to the, the other things that I did as a sinner. I have ceased from it because I don't want it anymore. When I got saved, somebody said to me, do you want some wine? I said, no. Well, why not? I said, well, I just don't. He said, well, oh, yeah, you're a Christian now, right? You're a born-againer. You can't drink. I said, you don't know me very well. No, I can drink. I don't want to drink. There's a difference between that. I don't want to. In Christ, I have liberty. I could choose to have a beer. I could. But why don't I? Because I don't want to. I don't want that. I have ceased from doing the things that stumbled me in my life. I don't want to go back to the vomit. I don't want to go back to that, to that mud that I, as a pig, was washed clean from. I don't want to go back there. That's all that is. So when you're going through persecution, by the way, or affliction, well, the desire for sin is really reduced. Uh, suffering has a way of killing our fleshly desires. It has a way of refining our faith. And so persecution is causing them to have a deeper desire for heaven. Suffering with Christ puts an end to our connection with sin. Why? Well, we are now dead to sin and no longer stirred by an overwhelming desire for it. Romans 6, verses 6 and 7. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. So the believer is no longer stirred by its incitements or its seductions. There's just a very basic thing. Dead people are no longer tempted. Right? Dead people are no longer tempted. I knew somebody who, um, I went and prayed for her before she died. She died of lung cancer. She was a voracious smoker for her entire life. And I went to her, and I prayed for her when she was in the hospital. And even in the hospital, she was finding ways to get up to smoke a cigarette. I remember a guy who had had one of those holes in the, in the throat, tracheotomy, I think they called it something like that. And he would take out his breathing apparatus to take a hit from his cigarette. I mean, we're talking about addiction here. We're not, we're, not, we're not speaking about a casual smoker. But I guarantee you, when this woman died, when that guy died, there was no more craving for it. Because dead people don't crave things. They're dead. If you're dead to sin, if you're alive in Christ, that's the point he's making. If you're walking with the Lord and you're in love with Jesus, the things that took you away from him or kept you from him are not things you want anymore. You don't want those things anymore. Those things have faded away. Why? Because something greater has come. Something better. A relationship with God. Eternal life through Jesus Christ. We're dead. We're dead. So we're no longer stirred by the incitement and seduction of sin. Romans 6.11, he said, Likewise, you also reckon or consider, conclude reason, consider yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So pursuing the Lord has set you free from those things that held you in bondage. We're alive in Christ. Colossians 3, verse 3, he said, You are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Galatians 2.20, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and, and gave himself for me. I'm crucified in Christ, nevertheless I live. So, verse 2, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh and for its lust. So, we arm ourselves with the attitude that we will no longer live to satisfy our flesh. This inner battle against fleshly lusts is part of the warfare that we go through. Again, though we're born again, there are still inclinations, still things that we're drawn to, if you will, to satisfy. So it's an inner battle. So when we're saved, we turn from sin and we die to fleshly desires. And, and as a believer, every day making a determination, I want to live to please God. Jesus taught me to do that and I want to do that. Your life goes through a steady process of 
of shedding those things that at one time had kept you captive. It's called the process of sanctification where God is cleansing you through, through prayer and the word of God by his Holy Spirit so that you're becoming more like Christ. We want to please him. Notice in verse 3 how he says, we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness and lust and drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. Huh. We spent enough of our past lifetime doing the will of Gentiles. Instead of living for the will of God when we were unsaved, and again, he's writing to Gentile uh, people. Instead of living for the will of God, we lived an entire lifetime living, doing what would be called the will of the Gentiles. And what does that mean? Well, the Bible makes it very clear that Gentiles, when it's used in the New Testament, very often is speaking of those who do not know God. And as a result, they're living in the flesh. The Galatian churches were Gentile churches. So in chapter 4, verse 8, Paul said to them, when you did not know God, you serve those which by nature are not gods. And so the Gentiles are those, Paul said the same thing to the Ephesians, you did not know God. You had no relationship with him. And so what he's doing here, when he speaks here in verse 3 concerning the life, uh, the will, rather, of the Gentiles, he begins to share some of the things that they were known for, what pagans are known for. These are describing what are called inner passions. These are the inner passions of someone who doesn't know the Lord. Now, again, notice how he speaks of this as when we walked. Again, I've been sharing with that, you, uh, that with you on Sunday mornings, and I've spoken the Christianese, you know, what it means to walk. is It's the way you order your life. He said that when you ordered your life by fleshly desire. And then he gives you a few of these particular sins. Licentiousness. Did you use that word today? No? It's not a word we use very often. What does it mean? It's, it speaks of unbridled excess. It's the, it speaks of just not only not just going to the, to the edge, but smashing through it. Licentious. Just doing shameless, impure things. He speaks of lust. A lust is a craving. It's a longing. In this context, it speaks of desiring that which is forbidden. Drunkenness, I don't have to tell you what that means. I look out there, and I see a lot of you who know what that means. <laughs> Drunkenness. Drunkenness speaks of being inflamed, inflamed with wine. Revelry, that's an interesting word. I, I wanted to give you a more precise definition of this. It's, a, it's an, a nocturnal, something that takes place at night. It's a riotous procession of half-drunken people who after supper paraded through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus or some other deity. It's Mardi Gras. That's what that's called, revelries. It's the Mardi Gras. It's those kinds of things where people are drunk and you know, doing crazy things. That's what he's speaking about. But he also speaks of drinking parties. These are literally drinking matches beer pong or whatever. These are drinking matches. Then he speaks of abominable idolatries. What is that? It's the abominations that were practiced at their idol feasts, where they not only worshiped the idol, but they did it with the most obscene and impure rites. So it, it speaks of things that I won't even say in mixed company. But it was just filthy, and that's what he's referring to, licentiousness and lust, drunkenness, revelry, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. That was the general state of the Gentile world. And by the way, that is the general state of ours. I mean, the Olympic thing, we're still thinking about that, you know, the Last Supper and all of that. There were people who were defending it. There were people saying, this is artistic. They didn't mean to offend. And you know what? That's the world. They don't know the difference between dark and light. They don't know right from wrong. For them, bitter is sweet. Sweet is bitter. Light is dark. Dark is light. And you'll see this in a minute. And so that's the way the world thinks. And so that's how it works. You know, for me, and I'll just say this quickly. I didn't prepare this, but 
to expect pure moral behavior from someone who doesn't know the Lord, it's just not, it's just not, it's just not fair for me to do that. It would be like me asking a five-year-old to drive to the store and pick me up something. You know, some will try, but they're probably not going to make it. <laughs> Why would I expect somebody who's incapable of doing something to do that? Why do I expect the world to be good when the Bible tells us it's not? Why do I expect the unbelievers to live like believers? And then why do I get upset with them? Well, I do in many ways. Like I said on Sunday, I get outraged by it because I have love for my, my Jesus. Somebody wrote something on a social page to my son recently, one of my sons, and said something about my wife to my son. And I said, it's a good thing I don't know who this person is because he'd end up going to jail for killing me because <laughs> it, it offends me that someone would say something. But at the same time, he really doesn't know us. He doesn't know my wife. He does, he's just being what the world is. So how can you be angry at people who don't know? Uh, when, when Jesus said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. That kind of thing still happens. And so that's why I think we should take the Gospels, share, pray, do the things the Bible says to us, learn to turn the other cheek, but voice. I don't think we should silently just, no, I think we should speak our mind, speak our heart, speak the Gospel, be very clear. I think people ought to know. As a result of what had taken place there at the Olympics, there were thousands of, of people who professed to be Christians in the streets saying, you can't do this. And there's a time for that kind of thing to take place, and I applaud them for it. But me here in the United States, being outraged, that's the best thing I can do. I can still talk about the Lord. I can encourage people to know Jesus Christ. I can pray for these people. They need Christ. And I can do the things that I'm, I'm limited to and probably most effective in doing. And so this is the world. This is the world we live in. And, I, and I, I, you know, I, to be angry at people for being what they are, what we want is we want them to come to faith in Christ so they can be transformed. That's the whole thing. And so he says in verse 4, in regard to these things, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. <laughs> That's you Christians. You see, when we live sober, godly lives, the world thinks we're strange for doing it. We're weird. And often they will speak evil of you for living and believing as you do. They think that believers are crazy because we don't live the way that they do. And they don't understand, as, as Peter has pointed out, that we are pilgrims and sojourners. This world is not our home. We're passing through. And so what do they do? Well, he says they, they speak evil of us. Why? Because they're ignorant of the God of righteousness. And so they will do that. They will speak to you. They think it's strange you don't run with them in the same flood of dissipation. So they speak evil of you for not doing those things, you self-righteous hypocrites and all of that. <sighs> I got to bite my tongue. So, verse 5, they will give an account to him who's ready to judge the living and the dead. The life that we live and the present value of it will show its worth on the day of judgment. They'll give an account to him who's ready to judge. The Bible tells us that this judge is, is the Lord Christ. He is the one rejected by men. And he's the one who was judged by them as unnecessary. In John 5, and 23, the father judges no one. He has committed all judgment to the son so that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. The father judges no one. He has committed all judgment to the son. They will give an account of themselves. Acts 17.31, he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, speaking of Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Romans 14.10, 
we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And so as he's speaking about this, they'll give an account for this reason. Verse 6, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. This is an interesting verse. Notice how he says, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. What do you mean, those who are dead? Well, this refers to the ones who've died after hearing the gospel. They heard, they believed, they were saved, they have eternal life. It says that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God. Well, they were judged according to man's standards. While they were alive, they already thought it was strange that they didn't run along with them in that way. So man has already made their judgment concerning them. Every one of us has already been judged according to human standards. Every one of us has people who look at us, and if you haven't had this happen yet, you will. Because they think it's strange that you don't do the things that you that they do, or because you may disagree with them when they hold fast to something that is unbiblical or wrong, they're going to judge you. And sometimes they'll do it on the job. If you work in an office, sometimes you will, your, your name will be brought up at the, at the water cooler, we used to say it that way, when people are taking their breaks. I say, man, did you see that? Did you, see, did you hear what he said? Did you, hear, did you see what she did? They'll say stuff about you. And I'm not saying go to, to work tomorrow looking over your shoulder. Who's gossiping? I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is it's just true. Because once you disagree, once they see that you're different, they're going to notice you. You might bring your Bible, put it on your desk, because and on your break you can read it. At lunchtime you can read it. And you may have somebody walk in and say, you can't have that there. And then they'll say, that Bible thumper, they will say that without even talking to you. They'll say that without ever having a conversation with it. They will. They'll say things about you. And, and they, they don't even know you. They think it's strange that you don't do these things. And, and they will judge you. What do you think, what do you think about, um, they might, might say, what, what do you think about same-sex marriage? Or what do you think about a, a man um, competing as a woman? And then when you tell them your biblical view, well, you're strange. How could you say that? This is unfair. You're wrong. And sometimes... Our politicians today, without getting political, but it's true, you know this if you watch, they, they campaign on those kinds of things to divide a nation between those who want to do biblically right things and those who don't. So they think you're strange, they'll say you're strange, and they'll make judgment of you, and they do. I, you know, as a pastor, I've been a pastor a long time, and um, there's been more than one person who's made judgment on me based on not knowing me, but what they have stereotyped me as to believe and to do. They already have me in some kind of little box of what I am and what I think and what I do, and they already make those judgments. That's just what they do. So you get used to it. We have been judged, what he's saying here, according to human standards. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4, gives me an answer how to deal with that. <laughs> Paul said, with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know of nothing against myself. Yet I'm not justified by this. He who judges me is the Lord. So I live as close to him as I can, and ultimately I trust him in his judgment, because his judgment is unbiased. So sometimes using outside appearances, Christians can look worse than unbelievers. Listen, remember, these people were referred to as haters 2,000 years ago. And, and you are too, if you don't agree with the standards of the world today. You're a hater. And so using outside appearances, we can look worse than unbelievers because they're so accepting. You see, we, we don't agree with much of what the world says that is good and is acceptable. But we know that there's more to life than what meets the eye. Why is that? Well, we have eternity in view. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14, it says, now all has been heard. Here's the conclusion of the matter. Fear God. Keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of man. God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. 
So you entrust yourself to the Lord who judges righteously. And God is the one who brings final judgment. His standard is always perfect. It's always just. And so at our judgment, when Jesus is there, we receive vindication in him. And then finally, verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers, and above all things, have fervent love for one another. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling. So we'll close with these last verses here. Again, the end of all things is at hand. Now, Peter is exhorting us to remain steadfast in the face of suffering. Remain faithful in the face of rejection. When he says in verse 7, the end of all things is at hand, that has obviously different applications. Uh, when he says the end of all things is at hand, there are commentators who are saying this could be referring to the soon conclusion of their lives, that they're not going to live that much longer. Under persecution or simply natural means, he's saying things are going to end soon. Therefore, live in a way that is prepared to meet the judge of the whole earth. So that's one way commentators look at this. There's a second application. The second application would be in reference to the return of Christ. If the return of Jesus is just around the corner, how should we then live? Now, this would serve as an incentive to live faithfully and with anticipation. I'll give you more of this this upcoming Sunday, but let me touch a couple of scriptures. The return of the Lord Jesus is referred to throughout the New Testament. Jesus promised us he would return. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again unto you and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. Let me give you one thought about this. When you go to Israel, you go to a particular city, and we have a chance to go through it. It's in Galilee. We go through this particular city, and you will see that houses that were built in this particular area were actually, they'd have a main house, but there were houses that were built alongside of them. So you actually have what we would today refer to as family compounds. So when Jesus was speaking there, in my father's house are many mansions. The word mansion is an unfortunate word that we today misunderstand the way it was used in 1611 with the King James. It's different than what we would use today. The word mansion is in reference not to a, you know, a, a huge house. It's in reference to a dwelling place. In my father's house are many mansions. In my father's house are many dwelling places basically attached to it. What was he speaking about? He's speaking about the family of God. He's saying that in my father's house, it's a community living with the father so that we have relationships as brothers and sisters in Christ. And so instead of living, you know, in this uh, Lone Ranger Christianity, where it's just me and Jesus and I need nobody else, the whole point Christ is making is you are a family, a community. You live together with the one Father, love one another and serve him together, and with anticipation expect to be with him. So that's one of the reasons why we get along here on earth. Because if we don't... <laughs> What's it going to be like in heaven? And so we need to learn to do that. But he's saying, I, I, I've gone to prepare a place for you. But if I go and prepare this place, I will come again and I'll receive you unto myself. You're going to be with him forever. That's a promise he gives. Revelation 22, verse 12. Behold, I'm coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to every man according to what he's done. Behold, I am coming quickly. Matthew 24, 44, therefore you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So the return is intended to provoke expectation, an expectation that results in righteous living. That's why Philippians 4, 5, let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. 
That's Romans 13, 12. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. 1 John 2, 28. Now little children abide in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. The end of all things is at hand. It can happen at any moment. We'll see this on Sunday, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So, do you believe that? If you do, how then should we live? Amen. How then should we live? How then should we live? If I believe that Jesus is returning, if I, if I really believe that, well, he tells me, one, he says, if I believe that, be serious. Be serious. He says, verse 7, the end of all things is at hand, therefore be serious. Be serious is serious-minded. Exercise self-control. Wait patiently. Be prepared. Resist acting as if he isn't returning. Don't return to your old life because you think the Lord is delaying his coming. One, be serious-minded. Two, be watchful. That word watchful means be alert but calm and collected at the same time. His return is not intended to make me into a date setter or a disaster hound. His return is to make me aware of the life that I'm living and the nearness of its conclusion. Here's something for you. You might find this interesting. I did. Live being aware that Christ is coming and your life is winding down. The average lifespan of a man is around 74 years. That doesn't say anything to me. My birthday's this upcoming month. I'll be 74. So I'll be dead August 24th. <laughs> All right. So... Maybe that's what made me think of this. That is 2.34 billion seconds, 38.9 million minutes, 649,000 hours, 27,000 days, 3,912 weeks. Okay, so what? Well, being aware of the return of Christ and your lifespan ought to make me sober-minded as I wait because each second I'm alive is one second closer to seeing him face to face, right? So when you look at it in the way I just said it, do you know that the average funeral normally has between, in this church has between three or four friends, three or four friends, who will come up and share, three or four friends. The average time that they will speak, I'm going to just give it, we'll say it's 10 minutes. Some of them want to speak forever, and others only say a few things. Let's average it at 10 minutes. So that's 40 minutes. 40 minutes of saying good things about that dead person. I want you to think. I want you to get sober-minded for a moment. I want you to think about this. It's true. 40 minutes of speaking about somebody who lived 649,000 hours. 40 minutes to say good things about that person in that pine box. And not a single word they say does that person ever hear. So what am I trying to say to you? Be aware of the time that you have 
and take the opportunity to tell your friends and your family and your loved ones how much you love them when you have the opportunity. The only time a man will get flowers, it's been said, is at his funeral. That's a fact. So we live every day thinking that tomorrow was promised, and it's not. Tomorrow is promised to no one. So live for Christ for today and love one another when you have opportunity and understand that he's going to come for us and take as many people along for the ride as you can. So open up your heart and speak the truth to people. Share the gospel with people. The most selfish person alive is the one who goes to heaven by themselves. So tell your friends and take the time to say how much you love that person, how much you appreciate that person. Those are very important basic things that a lot of people fail to do. And I can tell you, I've been in ministry a long time, and there are so many that I have seen over the years who will say things like, I wish I would have if I'd have only told him. I wish I'd have told him I love him. I wish I'd have told him more often. I wish I'd have told my, my wife how much I appreciate her. I always thought she knew, and now I can't. She's no longer here. I wish I'd have told my children how proud I am of them, how much hope and faith I had that they would be something God would use, and I'll never have that opportunity. You see, the Lord is returning soon. We need to live as if he's coming today, and the things that you would have to do that you should do, but are putting off, make sure you say those things now. We need to anticipate standing before the Lord. And then finally, our lives should be filled with prayer. We should be aware and in prayerful dependence on God, awaiting for him. He says in verse 8, above all things have fervent love. So when under persecution, it's easy to begin caring more for your own needs. What will help them all to hold fast to Jesus? Well, to have fervent love. Love is the supreme virtue of the Christian. Love shows that we follow him. We follow the Lord. It's, it's what cements us and makes us together. And it keeps us together when we're going through hard times. And love for one another isn't an option. It's central to our faith. It reveals the reality of our faith. Love for one another is to be fervent. That means we're to make maximum effort to love one another. So make maximum effort to love and care for one another. Now, of course, your faith will be stretched to the limit. Sometimes there are injuries, sometimes misunderstandings. But in Christ, we need to determine to love each other. Again, that's the mark of a believer. 1 John 4, 7, let us love one another. Love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The Bible tells us that love covers a multitude of sin. Believers overlook unkind acts. Why? Because we protect the unity of the body. And under hard times, petty differences should be kept at a minimum. Christians should choose to love because love preserves the unity of the body of Christ. And as we love, verse 9, we're to be hospitable without grumbling. Hospi hospitality during hard times is, is needed. And under their circumstances, the things they're going through, it's necessary. So in obedience and showing love, the church helps those who are in genuine need. And you do that without grumbling, without grumbling within yourself. Uh, the word grumble speaks of secret displeasure. It's not something you necessarily openly say. It's just something you're feeling. Somebody knocks on the door, and you, you open the door, and it's somebody you don't want. And you say, oh, hi, how are you? But inside you're saying, go away. You know, <laughs> why did you come to my house? So, hospitality is to be out of a sincere heart. And that means that, that our spirit, our life, the way we think, should be grounded in the love of God. One last thought, and then we'll close in prayer. I've said this so many times, but it comes to mind every time I think of this kind of subject. Coming out of the background I came out of, and it wasn't as, as heavy and long as many went through. It was only a few years. 
But one of the things I saw in the drug and alcohol culture that I lived in, in the hippie generation, where we were all talking about love and peace and called everybody brother and sister and all of that garbage, is we would use the word love, but we didn't know what it was. Love was really lust. And love was really just taking advantage of somebody's generosity. Love was making sure that we were taking care of ourselves. That's what love was. And so when I had some friends who started going to a place called Calvary Chapel in the early days, and they, they told me that they were Christians, they were born again, I didn't know what that meant. Because words are just words. I thought I was a Christian, so they're calling themselves Christians. What's the difference between you and me? You say you believe in Jesus. I think I do. You think love is good. I think I do. What's the difference? Well, the difference was when I went to church with them, and I saw a group of people who all thought like they did to the degree that I was extremely convicted because I was nothing like them. And one of the things that drew me to Christ, two of the things, was one is I would go to a friend's house and they would have meals there that, that he, he would actually buy food and, and the, young, the girls would actually cook. That, that's a lost art. But the girls, <laughs> the, girls would actually, the girls would actually cook for the guys and they weren't, all, they weren't all mad and liberated. You should cook for me wasn't their attitude. They just said, you know what? We're brothers and sisters. We know how to cook. You guys, you really don't. And it was kind of like that. And, and then they'd give us meals. And I wasn't saved. And I remember sitting at a table where they said, before we eat, we have to pray. And I remember them praying, you know, God, thank you for this food. And, and I looked around. They weren't charging me. They didn't, they, they didn't make me feel bad because I didn't give anything. It was that kind of stuff where I saw them hug each other. With, without ulterior motives, without you know, trying to you know, get them into a bedroom. I, I, and I saw that, and I thought, this is different. They're not asking for anything. They're giving things. They're warm. And I was puzzled by that. I'd never seen that, ever. That's what God used to awaken me to my sinfulness, because I was nothing like that. So it wasn't simply telling me I was a sinner. I knew that. And when scripture had been quoted, I was guilty of that. Yeah, I don't seek God. That's true. I do these things. That's true. I agreed. But when they loved each other and gave and were warm, hospitable, that was part of what brought me to Christ. They knew I was they knew I was lost. But they loved me. And I knew it. And they didn't want anything from me. The only thing they wanted from me was for me to know Jesus. And after a while, that's what I wanted to. I want to be like you. I want to have a heart like that. I want to be a giver instead of a taker. I want to learn how to feel, because I don't. I want to know these things that you know. And so when the gospel was preached, and the Spirit convicted me, a large portion of why I came to faith is because we loved one another. And it still is that way. A lot of people know what you're against. Maybe they need to know what we're for.